Spectacular week of mild weather that is soon to change to some nasty heat and humidity. The kind of thing that stirs up European hornets, which is the Admiral's <laughs> worst nightmare. That is a state-like uh, compound over there by the river. Good morning, yeah, William. Those European hornets are something to be dreaded. It's fine. Good morning, Rob. Good, Good morning to, see to you, you, sir. Also, Delegate Michael Height is uh, in our presence as well. Good morning, Mr. Height. Good morning, Robert. Good to be here. Great to have you with us. You know, if you've ever been to the uh, the Admiral's compound, you can see why any insect or piece of uh, <laughs> living uh, creature would want to be there. Um, I tried to get, I tried a couple times to get there, but I couldn't get through all the various security checkpoints there are that, that you have um, to go through to get to the actual front door. You know, the guard, that's, the that's, guard um, building at the at the very front <laughs> and the gate. Um, <laughs> You, you have to have a uh, background check and everything to get through. But once you yeah. get through, once you get through, yeah. that that's where the European hornets come in. <laughs> <laughs> keep, keep guys reprobates yeah. like yourself out, Mike. Yeah. Rep, with a, he's, whoa, 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 whoa! He just ripped off a that. multisyllabic word like reprobate, like nothing right there. I'm learning, Rob. I'm I'm going home at night and practicing. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'm I'm impressed. I'm, uh, my heart is pounding here. I've got a pump of adrenaline. Going. <laughs> our uh, first guest of the show today and for the first time on our program we are uh, pleased to welcome in the shepherd university president uh, mary cj Hendricks. president Hendricks, thank you so much for being with us today well i'm delighted to join you thank you so much and and may i just say i've been to the admiral's compound <laughs> and it is well guarded yes. by two gorgeous dogs test one test two little <laughs> Tess, and big Tess. yes, yes. <laughs> He's soon to add a French poodle, Le Tessler, which we discussed last week on the program. You know, well, it's, e it's easier to get into Camp David than it is. To I, <laughs> come on, come on, Miss President, take up for me on this. Uh, oh Bill, my, Bill, 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 Bill. Uh, I want to ask you first, uh, Dr. Hendricks, the positive publicity that Shepherd University has gotten over the last month uh, in concentrated form, but certainly uh, over the last uh, at least a year, because of uh, quarterback Tyson Bagent has got to be worth hundreds of thousands do of dollars, if not millions, in free promotional campaign advertising uh, information that's gotten out there because of the number of times Shepherd University has been mentioned along with this kid has become a national phenom. Oh, he sure has. And I want to tell you what a hardworking, highly disciplined, humble young man. And we are so proud of him. But there are announcers now throughout the United States of America who know how to pronounce Shepherd. It's not Shepard. It is <laughs> Shepherd University. They know where it is. Uh, it is great. We are all beaming. And I have to tell you this. Many of my colleagues from Northwestern University, where I came from before I joined Shepherd, are now saying, wow, this is fantastic. We all want to go to Shepherd. Um, visit it. Tyson Bagent, he is going to be our great quarterback. So thank you for bringing that up. We have great expectations. Yes, and now they're still spelling it seven different ways, but at least they're <laughs> pronouncing it properly. That, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think my first exposure to Shepherd University was in the early 90s uh, when I went there to call a football game and uh, just absolutely fell in love with the campus and the the whole atmosphere that is Shepherd University. So and it's only continued to grow and get better since then. And I understand you welcomed in your largest freshman class this year? Oh, yes, we did. I'm very excited about this. And of that freshman class, about 70% of those students are from West Virginia. So we're really increasing the number of West Virginia students who are coming here. Overall, our ratio is about three to two, but that's starting to change a little bit. And, and we're smiling because it's not about bringing West Virginia students here. It's about keeping them here. Now, that, that's the good stuff uh, at first. I want to ask you about some of the more difficult stuff now, which is if you could give us an update on the university's financial situation and whether having a large incoming freshman class has helped alleviate some of those concerns. 
Well, uh, that is a great question. Um, I'm fully transparent about our financial situation, and we are working together with a very talented board of governors. And so right now, we have identified a $6 million deficit over the next two years. So we have to target $3 million per year uh, in cost savings or revenue generation, and I'm happy to report that we have hit our $3 million target for this year, and we're starting to work on next year. But when you think about revenue generation, we look at opportunities. Of course, tuition is a big part of our operational income. But also, we have funding from the state legislature. Uh, So thank you very much uh, to our state legislators for that. But also, extramural grants. That is a portfolio that is starting to grow at Shepherd, and we're very proud of that, but that is helping us meet our bottom line. But, but I'll tell you this, across the country, most universities are going through financial challenges. They're reviewing their operational budgets and their academic programs, and we're all undergoing what we call right-sizing or strategic streamlining. Uh, just like WVU, Marshall, other great universities in our state. So we're all in the same boat. Could you tell us about the vote coming up uh, in regards to the Martinsburg, uh, Shepherd University Martinsburg Center? Uh, Yes. You know, the Martinsburg Center, which has been a a big part uh, of our growth over the last 10 years, well, as you can imagine, um, covid really compromised our ability to be able to sustain and maintain that center. The utilization went way, way down. We spend about $500,000 a year just to run that center. And unfortunately, we're going to have to close it in December. Our Board of Governors uh, is behind us uh, in supporting that vote, which will come up in September. So unless something happens between now and our next Board of Governors meeting, which is in the middle of the month, uh, sadly, we will have to close that. How long have you been aware of any financial issues or concerns with the university? Was it uh, mostly within the last uh, six months to a year, or have there been concerns for some time? You know, that is an interesting question because we are doing this historical uh, deep dive investigation into when did this happen? Why didn't we know sooner? And I will tell you that when we have transitions in CFOs, and we've had quite a few uh, since I've been here, something is always lost in the transition. And right now, we have a new CFO who joined us in late October of 2022. And he started looking at our financial records, and this assessment did not become apparent to all of us until May. So May of this year, we looked specifically at our unrestricted cash. So our restricted cash looked great, um, but our unrestricted cash was becoming anemic. And that is what we're focused on right now, trying to build that up. Now, of course, the HEPC, the Higher Education Policy Commission in Charleston, expects every university in the state to have about 50 days of operating cash um, at the end of the year. And, And so overall, of course, that looks good for many of us, but we're really focused again on that unrestricted cash. We, in order to meet our target, we have had to eliminate or freeze probably about 50-some positions at Shepherd. Just within the last few months, we've been very, very busy over the summer. And you may have heard, we, uh, like other universities, are going through an academic program assessment. And the first thing we did that was just voted upon at the August meeting of a Board of Governors, we reduced our number of colleges from four to three. So now we have a very streamlined college model. That was step number one. 
And that saved us probably close to $225,000. Now we're going to dive into each program, each major that's offered, each minor that's offered, and see how they're working for us and, and if they're still highly enrolled. So obviously we have Delegate Mike Height here. And uh, yesterday we had an interview with uh, the executive director of the West Virginia Center for Budget and Policy. And uh, they have claimed that the state has not kept up an appropriate level of funding for universities. Now, I'm not trying to start a fight between you and, and, and Delegate Height, uh, but rather I would like to hear a line of communication regarding it, not that there isn't one established already. Uh, in regards to the state level of funding that Shepherd University gets, do you have any questions or points of concern that you'd like to relay to Delegate Height? Well, Delegate Height, I think you've been set up here just a little bit, and, and I apologize. I'm not sure um, what you're talking about or referring to, Doctor. <laughs> but, but let me just say, um, when I joined Shepherd, and now it's been a, a, almost seven years ago, I looked at how much funding came from the state of West Virginia. And it's always hovered around... 15 to 20 percent of our overall budget. Now we're at about 18 percent. And, and so when you think about it, and, and I say this sometimes, uh, not in a pejorative manner, but I say that the state of West Virginia is a minor investor uh, in the amount of money that we are given to operate with. However, when you think about everything the state does for us with respect to the Higher Education Policy Commission, you know, guiding us through uh, every month calls and guidance for new rules, when, when you think about other sources of funding that HEPC gives us, you know, the whole picture looks better. But right now, our university um, is ranked number five with respect to the funding we receive, which, which I said is about 18% of our overall budget. So as you can imagine, WVU is number one, Marshall's number two, uh, Fairmont State University is number three, West Virginia State University has pushed us out of the number four spot, so they're number four now, and we're number five. But I'll tell you, seven years ago, we were dead last. We were at the bottom of this list uh, at number 10, and we worked hard. Our Board of Governors reached out to key legislators, and they told them that um, when you look at what we bring to the table and our economic return on investment, we really should have more funding. Now, our legislators finally got together we were working with them. We now have, for the first time, a state funding model. And this will be our first year going into that model where each university will be ranked and assessed on their tuition uh, graduation rates, on how many students we have, enrollment, and many other factors. And that is going to be a fair way to be able to distribute precious resources from the state. Delegate Knight. Uh, so I think you brought up two very key points when it comes to the legislature. I, I think what we would like, and I, I don't want to speak for legislators in the past. I'm, I'm a freshman legislator, so um, I'm going to just speak from my own point of view. I think what legislators have tried to do is, is look at two things that you mentioned. Number one, be, there being a, a fair distribution of of state funds to colleges and universities across the state um, based on performance and enrollment and things like that. Um, and I don't know that that was always the case. And I, and I think we um, have addressed that. And then the other th that you also mentioned was right sizing. I think there was a a, uh, a look from the, the legislation and, and they thought maybe that um, there wasn't a right sizing of a lot of these colleges and universities. There was uh, an overfunding um, in some in certain areas, and especially when you see enrollments dropping um, and and the funds continuing to go up and up and up. So I think there was a, a push a few years back from the legislation to say, listen, um, the 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 
colleges and universities themselves need to look inward and saying, are we right-sized? Are we, are we providing the product that we're supposed to be providing in an efficient manner? And I, I think that's really what's happening right now. You can see it at Shepherd. You can see it at WVU. And these are, are painful looks inward a lot of times when you're talking about cutting programs and, and making sure that we're providing um, a, a, a good level of uh, higher education at the same time. Right, and and I'm so appreciative that you have that perspective. I, I really am, and uh, we just keep our fingers crossed that now we have a new pathway to follow. We have performance metrics to hit, and and so this is great. It's now a level playing field. So thank you very much. Also, I want to add. I think we're especially lucky living in the Eastern Panhandle to have so many distinguished legislators right here. I mean, when you go to Charleston, the Eastern Panhandle should have their own big section, right? I agree with you. (laughs) Yes, yes. And we should have a statue for each one of them. (laughs) (laughs) But But, Mary, you make a great point that that if you look at the Eastern Panhandle in the past, and I don't know that we were always represented in Charleston, not that the people weren't representing us uh, well, but we didn't have a whole lot of power in Charleston. But if you look now at the makeup of the Eastern Panhandle, the, the individual delegates and senators of the Eastern Panhandle hold very powerful positions in Charleston now. So that whole landscape has really changed for the Panhandle, and and you're right to point that out. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Good morning, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mary, many folks know, but probably everybody does not know, that prior to coming to Shepherd, you had a very distinguished, a very illustrious career as a uh, a cancer researcher. And then you went on to head one of the premier cancer research facilities in uh, in northwestern, uh, part of northwestern. So uh, I think Shepherd did a great job in getting a renowned, well-known researcher to take over the the reins of Shepherd University. Uh, A couple of things you raised uh, one you mentioned money coming from uh uh ex curriculum uh you just got a large uh, grant from national science foundation for cyber security would you speak to that please oh i'd love to uh admiral bill uh i i just i'm so tickled about this you know shepherd was traditionally considered a teaching college and uh, so when I joined Shepherd, I, I looked at the names of all of our faculty who won the West Virginia Professor of the Year Awards and all the finalists. And I will just tell you now, we are developing a culture of research. And, and I think you linked it to, to my background and my desire to see this university thrive with all of our talented faculty and staff and students. So right now, I am proud to say <clears throat> that we have over $13.5 million this year in extramural support. Um, a lot of it comes from the congressionally, <clears throat> excuse me, directed spending, these awards, but the National Science Foundation grant that you mentioned, uh, which was for $637,000, this is for the networking uh, infrastructure. And uh, the principal investigator for this award, Dr. Yarda Fleeter, is just an unbelievably talented individual. We stole him uh, from George Washington University, where he ran a large cyber center there. And this cybersecurity infrastructure is going to allow us to do more data-driven research and to get into the research and education networks uh, that have been a little bit difficult for us to be part of. Uh, so this is going to allow all boats to rise uh, at Shepherd with respect to research uh, and all sorts of exploration and investigation. So I'm excited about that. I can also tell you about a few others uh, that we're very proud of as well, if you'd like. Yes, please. Please do. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, well, we have a $2.6 million grant from the Health Resources and Services Administration, known as HRSA. And this is to advance the nursing education workforce. I mean, this is just remarkable. This is going to help pay for uh, more of our nursing students, nursing faculty, and to develop partnerships for rural and underserved communities for primary care. I, so what an incredible opportunity for that. Uh, we also have $4 million to, uh, to increase our security networks here uh, to be able to have, say, more police vehicles and security cameras on campus. And also, uh, because Bill, I, you probably wouldn't mention this, but we're very proud of the support uh, from Congress for the Stubblefield Institute's Listen, Learn, and Engage initiative. This has brought our entire campus together for very important discussions. And we're very hopeful that the quarter of a million dollars to expand this initiative from the federal government will come through. It's been approved for funding, so we're just hopeful for that. And then lastly, I'll just mention one project because it's going to be transformational for our campus, and that is the East Loop Project, funded by Senators uh, Manchin and Capito. They were our main advocates here. Um, and what that involves is if you've been to our campus recently, you will see that we've been able to demolish two very old residential halls, Turner Hall and Kenneman Hall. So they've come down. So that frees up a large part of our East Campus Loop to build uh, new buildings, to bring in developers. I'd love to see a conference center. I'd love to see an extended stay facility and an age-friendly condominium complex. And then we have funding for what is known as the gateway entrance. So just imagine as you drive onto our Shepherd East Campus to see a great big archway that says Shepherd University. We can hardly wait for these projects to come to fruition. Uh, yeah, Mary, you've uh, you've also mentioned, uh, or you have not mentioned, but frequently when there's become tough times for, uh, with the university, it's the burden is shifted to the uh, to the students by raising tuition. It's my understanding you've worked very hard to minimize the tuition increase. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct, Bill. I I have to tell you, you know, coming back from COVID numbers. Um, where we were at our lowest for uh, enrollment. Uh, so if we just think about this, um, during the fall of 2021, my goodness, you know, students were afraid to come back to campus. They were still at home. We were just a little over 3,000 students. Now we're coming back to be um, a little over 3,200 and when you look at that and you look at tuition, we have kept tuition steady uh, over the last four, five, six years. We have only raised tuition by $498 per student, and that happened last year. So it's very important to us that we make college affordable and that we are not going to balance our financial challenges on the backs of our students. No. We are highly competitive for tuition rates, and uh, our students know that. And we do everything we can to help our students. Seventy-two percent of our students receive a scholarship. Seventy-two percent. So that's very important, private funding. Mary, what is the uh, the recruitment's part of it? The retention's the other part. What is your retention rate, uh, and also what is your graduation rate? So, uh, Bill, um, I don't want to misquote numbers, but um, if you look at our graduation rate, uh, we are trying to get it uh, at least to seventy percent. We have targets, so between sixty and seventy percent. Um, and, and that's very, very important. And, and then the other question you asked, Bill, was retention. The, retention is the number one theme 
for this year. So our retention rates, again, uh, not where we want them to be, uh, but we want to get them as high as possible in the 90 percentile. But, but I want to tell you what's helping us in this area. Several years ago, we created the Shepherd Success Academy. And, and I don't know if you've heard of this, but this is an extraordinary uh, opportunity for our students who feel that they need a little extra help coming in the door to be able to join this Success Academy. Uh, and I'll tell you, retention rates there are very, very high. They are over 90%. So when our students have a coach, success coach they can go to, we know they're going to succeed and they're going to stay here. Now, it was supposed to be for first-year students, but now it's extended to second and third year because they really appreciate that help. So we have targets and goals. We're not where we want to be, but we're going to get there. Rick Alderton says hello to Dr. Hendricks from one of her old classmates from St. Joe's. Oh, St. Joe's. Well, hello and thank you so much. I I stay in contact with several of my St. Joe former classmates. Um, Many of them have gone to Shepherd, and uh, we kind of smile. And, uh, you know, it's a privilege to be able to come back here and, and just help these wonderful students have the same opportunities that I had when I was here. Uh, quick question for you before we let you go, Dr. Hendricks, and that is in regards to Shepherd graduates. Bill was asking about retention and graduation rates. What is uh, effectively the employment rate of Shepherd graduates? Uh, how, e- how easily do they get their first job out of college? Do we know that number? Uh, the employment rates are remarkable, especially in nursing, education, and business. These are our big market drivers. I will tell you that 100% of our nursing graduates have jobs lined up before they graduate. That, that's incredible. Business as well, the accounting department is incredible. Education, you know that we have a paucity of teachers in this state and surrounding areas, so they all have jobs. So uh, in those particular areas, I would say 100% of our graduates get jobs. The other areas, I'm not going to misquote, but uh, I will tell you that we're very fortunate to be in the 75 to 85% range for those individuals. Any final questions for Dr. Hendricks? We're good. Uh, thank you very much, Mary, for coming on. Uh, there's been a lot of talk, a lot of uh, questions about our uh, higher education, uh, and and I thought it was very appropriate for you to state where uh, Shepherd is and how you're doing and, and your future outlook for Shepherd. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much. It was just such a privilege and pleasure to join you. I hope you'll have me back. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mary. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.